Some say that alongside this see-it-to-believe-it world is the shadowy realm of the supernatural. Sometimes the residents of that dimension touch us, and in one moment, our lives are changed forever. America's Lady of Supernatural Thrillers, Mary Ann Pohl, is your real ghost chatter host. On this podcast, you'll hear stories by real people who have seen real ghosts. Gordon tells us about an unwelcome encounter with his dead father-in-law. And Lori tells us about a dead logger who looked for his wife and daughter for years after his death until she helped him find peace. Then there's Victoria, who shares her story of a long-dead pig, Edna June, who still watches over her ranch. Did you know a cafe in Anchorage, Alaska is haunted by the ghost of a woman who was blown to bits by a hired hitman? Once in a while, Mary Ann will podcast a tale taken from the genre she loves best, the supernatural. These are just a few of the stories you will hear, and these stories just keep coming. Welcome to today's Real Ghost Chatter episode. Have you heard about Anchor? If you haven't, I'm here to tell you it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free, and I mean free. I haven't paid a dime to produce or distribute my podcasts. There's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. How easy is that? Podcast distribution can be a headache, but not with Anchor. Anchor distributes your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many, many more. As a bonus and not an obligation, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Anchor has everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. I'm Mary Ann Paul, America's Lady of Supernatural Thrillers, a charter member of Author Masterminds, and your host on Real Ghost Chatter. To learn more about me, please visit www.maryannpoll.com or www.authormasterminds.com forward slash mary-ann-poll. Due to COVID-19, hurricanes, and a few other unforeseen events, my guests have been unable to interview. Not one to let the grass grow under my feet, I've decided to read chapters from one of my supernatural thrillers weekly. I'll also broadcast interviews as much as I can when my guests are able to get online. I'm starting with Raven's Cove, The Supernatural Battle for a Small Alaska Town. It is the first book in the Iconoclast Thriller series. And there are four books in the series, and you can find each of them on the websites I just gave you. Chapter 1, A Corpse on Corpse Mound. Kat gripped a large soup cup of coffee, warming her hands as she watched the late October sunrise from her porch. The day came up cold and blue, the crystalline sky announcing the dawn. Little by little, she turned to the west, the morning clouds of peach tinged in gray leaving her sight. A view of Cook Inlet replaced the eastern scene. Good morning to Katnu. She breathed her favorite name for the Cook Inlet. Thank you to Katnu for sustaining the Denali Indians and the white settlers who joined them here. A mist rose over to Katnu, cold meeting the heat of a new morning sun. The mountains across the water were purple from the mist, but today the volcano stood in its full glory, high, clothed in wisps of light pink clouds. A gust of cold wind shattered the morning warmth. Kat shivered and tightened her grip on the coffee cup. She inhaled the saltwater-laced air invigorated by the scent. With one last look at the volcano, she turned, opened the heavy wood front door of her cabin and walked through. A black blur rose up from behind the red footstool at the end of her couch and pounced. Ouch, for heaven's sake, BC, knock it off. Cat jumped back, annoyed, the tranquility of her morning broken by her mischievous, self-absorbed feline. I should have left you for dead. Tail in air, signaling his mission a complete success, B.C. sauntered to the small bedroom off the living room and combined kitchen area, which made up Cat's home. Focus, Cat, focus. She turned to her old blonde desk, 
running a finger along one of its many scratches and nicks, avoiding the stress for a moment longer. You need to decide what to do with your life, girl. Enough of living in this small town, writing poems, doing some art, making trinkets for the tourists, and hoping to have enough to live on until the beginning of the next funnel head invasion. Resolving to the task, she thumped her coffee cup down on the desk, splashing a small amount onto a poem in progress. Facing the monitor, she clicked the internet link and began perusing the many advertisements for online colleges. A loud rap at the front door brought her out of the internet fog saturating her brain. Another knock, more impatient this time, followed by a familiar voice shouting, Open up, kitty cat. I know you're in there. Come out, come out wherever you are. A cat pushed back from her desk, bumping Ernie at the corner and nearly spilling her coffee, ugh. She opened the door to Wendy Herling, her lifelong friend. Oh, look, it's my annoying lifelong friend. Wendy breezed past Cat into the cabin. Cat glared at her while bowing and extending her arm. Do come in. Wendy responded with a bow of mock courtesy. Don't mind if I do, Miss Kitty Cat. What brings you here so early in the morning? News, real news. There's been a murder, Cat. A murder in Raven's Cove. Wendy started yanking on Cat's arm. Come on, let's go see. Cat resisted, planting both feet on the worn wood planked flooring. Dread replaced the irritation she felt moments before. Who is it? Don't know. No one knows him. Cat relaxed, guilt niggling her gut because she felt relief instead of concern for this stranger. Sheriff Anderson is in a real dither. This sleepy old town is jumping for once. Let's go. Your concern for others is not one of your strong suits. In fact, you should have moved to Hollywood, Winsome. Your drama would be appreciated in Tinseltown. The familiar nickname mocked Wendy as it had for years. Wendy stuck her tongue out at Cat, crossed her arms, and plopped on the couch. See what I mean? Your drama is wasted here in Raven's Cove. Wendy rose. I will forget you said that. BC, in the act of settling into a warm, windy lap, tumbled to the floor, feet first, of course. He sat, tail swishing from side to side, considering his plan of attack. Seeing this, Cat said, yes. I believe we should go before you can't walk. Wendy looked at BC and swung her leg to the left right before he pounced. Missed you, mean black thing. Why do you keep this cat, Cat? Wendy smiled at the double meaning. He's my protector, can't you see? BC walked over to Cat and twined through her legs, rubbing black hair all over her clean beige pants. She bent and made several swipes at the hairs, embedding them farther with each attempt. Wendy sniggered. Well, maybe if you named him, he'd be a happier animal. BC for black cat? How original is black cat, anyway? Let's go, Winsome. Enough criticism of my name choices and your theories of how names affect animal behavior. Cat grabbed her coat and headed for the door, which made a satisfying click as she closed it. The clouds hanging over the Cook Inlet earlier were gone. Cat and Wendy walked out into the late October sun burning overhead. The gravel driveway crunched under their shoes as they strode toward the dirt road leading to Cat's home. Ravens, jet black against the blue sky, played in the wind, swooping toward Earth, then reversing the maneuver and streaking upward to meet a friend and dive together in a spontaneous air show. Main Street buzzed with activity. You weren't wrong about the gossip. When have I ever been wrong about gossip, Cat? Cat tapped her lips with a finger. I can't remember when you've ever been wrong about gossip. It is my job, you know. A great mission, Wendy, to know everything going on in this small South Central Alaska town. Well, someone's got to do it. Oh, that can't be good. Cat pointed to a pair of identical twins. Jonathan and Joseph Northen, the 20-something delinquents of Raven's Cove, stood by Joe's bakery, heads together in an animated conversation. Ah, they're afraid they'll get blamed. Well, don't know what's going on, but they should worry after all the trouble they've caused. They said he had no skin. They said his eyes were dribbling black and purple stuff. Who's they, Miss Connor? Cat asked the town's second most dramatic person. It is obvious this librarian shouldn't have access to the horror section, Cat thought. Anita Connor lifted her head, speaking down to Cat. Those who saw the corpse, she sniffed, closer to a huff, and turned from Cat. All righty then. Cat glanced at Wendy and rolled her eyes. I told you so. Sheriff Bart Anderson, whose formal title was police chief, lifted his head at the sound of Cat's voice. He excused himself from the conversation with Mayor Othell and beelined it for Cat. We aren't finished here, Chief, Mayor Othell said to Bart's back. Sheriff, sir, your official title is police chief. There are no sheriffs in Alaska. There's one now, Bart answered. Mayor Othell shook his head and walked toward City Hall. Why do you antagonize Mayor Orthel that way? Cat asked Bart. It'll get you in trouble someday. Police chief is too formal. People respond better to sheriff. If you say so. I do. Anyway, glad you're here. We need to get to the office pronto. Phones are going to be ringing off the hook. 
Cat, secretary for the good sheriff of Raven's Cove when the need arose, looked up at Bart. Deep lines creased his rugged, youthful face. Uneasiness rose up from her gut to her heart. Bart hooked Cat's elbow in his hand and guided her into the three-room storefront on Main Street, the town's police station. The rarely occupied jail cell in the back made it, but barely, four rooms. Turning to face her, he took her shoulders in a gentle but firm grip. I want you to start locking your doors at night. Whoever committed this murder is a real psycho. Cat stared, eyes wide, into Bart's sincere brown ones. He responded to her silent question. Amos Thralling found a body at the top of Raven's Ravine this morning. The way the victim met his demise, well, I've never seen anything like it. Bart paused, shook his head. Not even in the classes I've attended on crime scene investigation. This one is going to take some major police work just to find the murder weapon or weapons. And you know what's almost as bad? No, Cat answered. We're going to have to send the body to Anchorage to find out what killed him. Then all those outsiders from the Alaska State Troopers and maybe the FBI are going to find out. They'll swoop in to take the glory and muddle up my investigation in the process. Okay, Cat answered. Anyway, here are my first notes for the report. He shoved them into Cat's hand. Read them and see what you think. I know you like to do research on your old computer. Maybe if you get the time, you could take a look. You might come across something helpful in your technology travels. Cat eased into the desk chair and read. Amos Thralling said he took his usual route to the Cook Inlet when he saw what he thought to be a garbage drop. When he approached, he became aware of a stink he attributed to said garbage. The smell of decaying flesh made him throw up. He got close enough to see the remains of a man. Upon this discovery, Mr. Thralling ran like his pants were on fire, his words, directly to the sheriff's office. Mr. Thralling accompanied me to said location of the body. Upon arrival, I observed decayed flesh, yellow in color, seeping into the ground. The eyes of the corpse were black and rotted with a blood consistency liquid of purple black draining from both eye sockets. The corpse lay face up, absent all its teeth. The mouth remained open and I observed the tongue to be missing. Distinguishing characteristics still present allowed me to ascertain the gender of the victim. My conclusion is the victim died elsewhere and the perpetrator or perpetrators used Raven's Cove as a dumping ground. Cat looked up at Bart. Purple and black? Yellow flesh? Yep, advanced decomp. Though I don't remember such a decayed state on a corpse where the body is still held together by muscle and tissue. And you know what else is odd? Cat gave Bart a questioning look. He lay on corpse mound at the opening to the ravine. I mean, laid out just like the outline on the mound. Some sicko. Bart shook his head in disgust. So lock your doors and windows, young lady. Not a suggestion, an order. Cat's indignant eyes fired invisible arrows into Bart's. I pray this dirt pack has crawled back into whatever hole he came out of. If not, Bart's voice trailed off in thought. If something happened to Cat, I'd never forgive myself, he thought. Cat stopped listening at an order. Her thoughts turned to the legend handed down for centuries. She battled with herself about bringing up the story. She decided, took a deep breath, and readied herself for the backlash to come. The legend of Corpse Mound has an eerie similarity to this. I can't see how a legend started in the 1700s is at all relevant here. I need information with a smidge more pertinence. This is no time for tales of goblins, witches, and dark things. You know there's more to it than goblins and witches. Cat locked eyes with Bart, daring him to defy her. Bart snorted, right, and pigs fly. What do pigs have to do with anything? If you're questioning this death as supernatural, then for sure this is going to stir up the old tale about the ravine. What if it isn't just an old tale? Stop. You are one of the most logical people I know until it comes to this subject. Stop. I'm just saying our ancestors' stories say these types of murders have happened again and again over the centuries, and stop. Those are legends, not fact. There is no black evil in the ravine. Those are scary stories parents use to keep their kids from going to dangerous places no more. Now let's look for a flesh and blood suspect, shall we? Chastised and embarrassed, Cat turned and began typing. The tarnished brass bell above the glass entry door clanged. A disheveled, white-haired stranger stepped in. Can I help you? Hope so. I'm new in town and need directions to the church. Well, there are two here. The oldest and most popular is the Congregational Alliance run by the Right Reverend Martin Plotno at the corner of Maine and Willow. The man grimaced, quick to replace it with a warm smile. Cat dismissed the pain look as her imagination. No, ma'am, not the one on Maine and Willow. Is there another? There is a newer one. It's not as popular, 
a more fundamental church. Lots of fire and brimstone and teaching from the Bible. The pastor, Paul Lucas, is a nice enough sort. By the way, what's your name? Kat was thinking, maybe you are looking for a church in hopes of guilt relief and forgiveness for leaving a decaying, stinky corpse in Raven's Cove before you go on the run. Josiah Williams, he gave a short, quick bow. He clutched a black brim hat in his hands and held it at his waist. Well, Mr. Williams, Josiah, please. He bowed again, raised his head and looked into her eyes. I can feel we are going to be friends. Alarm rose in Cat's gut. The last time she felt this way, the stray cat, dubbed BC, had just bitten her arm while she was trying to dress his open wounds. Well, Mr. Williams, if you are interested in the new church, it sits on Birch, just off Maine. Take Maine south until you get to Birch, turn right. Birch takes you out of town. It's a long uphill walk. Just keep going and you'll run into the church before you reach the wetlands. Thank you, Katrina Agnes Tovlosky. Pastor Lucas's church is the one I seek. Wait, how did you know my name? The clang of the bell answered her. Rethinking locking my doors and windows, Kat murmured. Look at the time. The clock read 11, or 0 or 1100, as Bart, the 24-hour clock is the only correct time advocate, would say. Kat placed both hands on the keyboard and started typing. Hey, kitty cat, thought I'd find you here. Winsome shouted in her ear. Cat jumped, banging her knee hard against the desktop. Ouch, dang it, Wendy. Wendy floated in front of Cat, placing her elbows on top of the computer monitor, ignoring Cat's obvious irritation. How's about lunch, girlfriend? Busy here. Cat's eyes never left the report as she continued to type. Wendy bent her head to look at the computer screen upside down, long copper curls cascading onto Cat's fingers and keyboard. Cat grabbed a handful of the red-brown locks and pulled. Ow! Wendy jumped back, frowned. She again put her elbows on top of the monitor. Come on. You know Joe's will be buzzing with the latest gossip. No. Cat raised her head and smiled up at Wendy. If you're going to Joe's, I could use a big cup of coffee. Me too, Bart yelled from his office. Wendy and Cat broke into simultaneous laughs. Fine, Bartster, Wendy yelled back. But I expect to be reimbursed. Right after you reimbursed me for last week's lunch, Wendy's lower lip came out in a false pout. She turned and sailed out the door. Doubt we'll ever see that cup of coffee, Cat yelled to Bart. If you enjoyed this podcast, I encourage you to share it with others you think would also be interested. If you'd like to know more about me, go to M-A-R-Y-A-N-N-P-O-L-L dot com and or authormasterminds dot com forward slash M-A-R-Y dash A-N-N dash P-O-L-L. Until next time, may the wind always be at your back, the sun on your face, and the good Lord walk beside you. Thank mm-hmm. you.